So uh, a question that maybe pertains to all of you, but especially uh, Michelle and your experiments. So I think we have a the sort of classic performance performance ethics trade off. In your case, performance transparency or explainability trade off. Uh, maybe in the medical context, it's one of the strongest cases for a kind of consequentialist approach, where like, hey, we're going to get higher vaccination rates and lower death rates if we don't say this information. Um, so I'm just wondering, what's your what's your current view on can we sort of cut these corners of these things that we think should be ethics principles? Yeah, so I, what I, the idea that I like is transparency at sort of the front door level, very similar to like learning health system transparency, which is also not frankly a thing, um, but should be. So front door, hi, welcome to Geisinger, or welcome to Mayo Clinic, whatever. Um, here's what we do, here's why we do it. Like there might be especially consequential health decisions where you want sort of procedure specific notice or even consent about AI. But I think for something like, you know, I mean, some people would say that the machine learning model here is like barely even AI, right? Um, so I think for some of these things where the stakes are low, maybe the way to balance it is general transparency about it up front and then not try to distract people with two separate messages in one SMS text message. So that's my current thinking. Can I ask you how, how it was it presented to them that it was an AI that was being used? So we did some pre-testing with online, like mTurkers, with online mm -hmm. participants. And we, because we, we didn't know, right? We said, do you want like machine learning? Does that mean something to you? AI, does that? And we tested lots of different things. And there weren't huge differences, to be frank, among mm -hmm. those. But the, the best performer, the, and there were a bunch of dependent variables, like would you get a flu shot if you got this message? Do you find this message? credible? Do you find it trustworthy? Do you find it accurate? Whatever. And computer-based analysis of your medical records. Mm -hmm. Sorry, computer algorithm-based analysis. Computer mm -hmm. algorithm-based was the winner. Um, so that's how we arrived at that particular phrase. And then the modalities were letter and or patient portal and or text message. Okay. Can, I, can I say one more thing on this one? So here's an interesting adjacent case. So Stanford has an algorithm that basically tells your physician whether you're likely to die in the next six months. And this is something they ran. And there's actually an on-point episode uh, with Magnum Chakrabarty on this topic. And you might think and this information is only given to your physician. So there's a way in which we might think actually less manipulation, less kind of hiding the ball from the patient. And yet I think many people have a viscerally strong reaction to this. The patients are not told this, or the physician's given this information. And I think one intellectual challenge is to say, how are the cases similar and different? And the kinds of things we might try to reach for as differences, I think the more you think about it, you're like, is that right? And stuff like that. So I find it interesting in thinking whether it's just the stakes are lower, whether that's what's doing the work, or whether it's this question about how would patients feel? Because you could imagine a version of this that was just sentiment analysis that basically said, if a patient were told after the fact this is what's going on, how would they react? And that should be our guiding star. That's very different than a truly worked out kind of ethical analysis about when are there obligations to disclose or not that are independent of sentiment. So I've, I have two questions, I think, but they apply to all three. In, in, in aggregate, apply to all three. So uh, the, the the first is is Michelle specific, um, which is I loved uh, the results about what happened when they were told that AI was involved in various degrees. And I'm wondering how much of that is a even though it wasn't significant, it was visible. Um, how much of that is a as a story about the trust relationship that people have with AI? and the stories people tell themselves about what AI is good for and, and, and how worthy it is, and, or how, um, to, to get into to Kristen's presentation, how they feel when they believe that they are observed by a, a, a complex system. And then the, the, the second question, um, I, I think is for all three, but it, it's primarily uh, uh, Kristen and Glenn. When, when these technologies are deployed, um, and they work, whatever work, particularly with affect recognition, whatever that means. How ex how worried are you? With, and this is with the case of the the democratization of expertise in in Glenn and Nicholson's example and the the affect recognition. Um, I want to go to this this last question that that Kristen raised, which is, 
what should we worry about? And to what extent should we worry about the deployment of these systems in protected, uh, safeguarded biomedical environments, normalizing them for other applications. So for affect recognition, I can imagine this in the commercial context or the, or the uh, you know, the restaurants. Oh, you look hungry. Would you like the really the really expensive dessert um, or, or things that are bad for you? And in the in the democratization of knowledge, I, I think about people doing their own research on vaccines, which already happen. So how do we build them so that we we get responsible biomedical AI to to borrow a phrase? Well, I'll be quick. Um, so the answer is I don't know. So it's a good question. Why? I mean, there's no significantly different. There's no significant difference, right? Statistically, year after year, but there is this small directional difference year after year. Um, actually, in study one, it was it edged out one of the other arms. So fairly, but not even perfectly consistent pattern directionally. Um, we can only speculate. And I think your speculation or your implied speculation is reasonable, right? That people may not trust this prediction coming from AI a tidge less than they trust it coming from a medical record review, coming from just an assertion you're at high risk. Um, you know, anecdotally, I can say we had various routes where people could sort of complain about this. There's the sort of patient experience line. There's also for employees. So there's 25,000 Geisinger employees and we are all part of the health plan and part of whatever. And so we are in this thing. Um, and there's a thing called Yammer that many of you may have experienced, which is like, oh, no? OK, well, it's like Facebook for employees. And it's a whole thing. Um, anyway, and you can go on and, and say whatever. So there were definitely people who did not believe their prediction. Um, were like, I'm not. You know, I, I run marathons. There's no way I'm at high risk. But none of them called out the AI. Um, they. A very just anecdotal evidence, but um, yeah, but we don't know from this type of, of work. We need to do other type of research to, to figure that out. Yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah. I will just say quick, very quickly, um, I, I don't think that people have a, a relationship with AI yet, you know, and I think that that's something that we, that people don't know what to think about it. I think the general public, and, and this is, you know, anecdotally, but also based on uh, another study I'm doing, looking at people's perceptions of AI, how they incorporate it into decision making. Um, and, and I don't think that people have an, uh, they don't know what to think. So, you know, this like notice and explanation, you know, with AI Bill of Rights saying we should tell people that AI is being used in their care. People don't know what to think about that. They, they don't know what the takeaway is, you know, and they won't know until we basically tell them or people tell them or there's a lot of, you know, kind of empirical data that's accrued, you know, based on the consequences of that. And I, I'll just say, you know, I do think that there are, to your second question, there are these kind of spaces where we might consider them to be sort of like sacred human things that we would just like to keep, you know, amongst us. Like, you know, that's just our like human activity that we feel that these things, that even if they could be done better by a robot like or a AI, you know, maybe we should designate what is like appropriate and what's sacred and what's not. So anyway, I know you um, you know, I'm going to respond back with uh, something actually from your own presentation, which is the point you made about HIPAA and kind of how it's good, but it doesn't reach everything. So what I think is interesting is that 10 years ago, I would have said HIPAA was a wall that keeps things in the hospital, but also keeps things from outside the hospital system, data flows out too, right? So the wall works in both directions. I'm less sure whether the next 10 years are going to look like that, especially that last, that second proposition in that... It seems to me we're rapidly entering a space where all data becomes health data in the sense of if you think what health data means is the ability to make inferences and predictions about people's health, it will turn out that I think much of the data that's very powerful to do so is actually not generated by electronic health records or physician reporting or labs. And I think part of what's interesting about that is whether uh, that means, as you say, that there's a normalization about this kind of prediction and this inferential society that starts in the hospital system where people are like, hey, it's great. It's not just your you know, age and all this. It's, let me tell you, you're high risk for flu, but also where you live and your Fitbit data and all this sort of stuff. And people are like, gosh, I'm so happy that you have a 360 view of my health state. And therefore, suddenly it's happy that you have a 360 view of my everything state, right? or whether it's still there's kind of a mental separation between my, my doctor knowing a lot about me and everybody knowing a lot about me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your presentations and comments. Um, 
I have a couple of questions that one might follow the other, but uh, to Michelle's um, study, I was wondering if it's AI or to Geisinger that they're reacting. Uh, because Geisinger might have this, uh, as the keynote speech alluded to, the beneficence um, that it comes with. And so I don't know if you had a condition where it was there was no Geisinger involved in telling them their uh, you know, risk. Well, no, because the, I mean, this was the health. This was coming from the health system, so it, it's a pragmatic, right, experiment. It wasn't, <clears throat> right? It, like, it, it has to be Geisinger. Because I would argue that their, it has. You know, most people these days, most of the health information for them is coming from online sources, outside of formal medical, you know, settings. I think Geisinger would not be happy if we texted or I mean, obviously we can't use the patient portal for and pretend that we're not right. But so. the average person like me, I, I'll go online. First thing I'll do yeah. is I go online to find out what my risk is about something. I'll use a risk calculator, which Stanford and Harvard and others all have, as you know, and they do predict uh, your heart attack risk in the next five years and so forth. Right? That's what is the norm for the vast majority of the population. So if we're really serious about finding out people's perception of AI, we should do it outside of the context of the deliverer of health, because otherwise it's confounded with the all the motives, the benefits, and so forth. I agree, I agree with that yeah. entirely. And again, anecdotally, some of the people who employees who are upset, I mean, like some of their other irritations with their employer bled out in their complaints and you could see. So I do think that it's not just AI, it's also the messenger, you know, back to the keynote, right? It's I, exactly, we just could not manipulate and pretend in this experiment and pretend that we were somebody other than who we were in this particular instance. But I, I agree that's something um, that's important yeah, to explore. Ultimately, I think you, you kind of alluded to this in your remarks to the previous question, the source matters, like who or what is the proximate source in their head when they're thinking about it? Is it, is it computer, just computer qua computer, that's machine as such as opposed to human, or is it anything specific to AI? Uh, and do, does AI have any any kind of specific uh, role, like making autonomous decisions? Is that what it is? That's different from a computer spitting out your data back. And those those kinds of nuances, I think, are not particularly available to most. Um, and so, my follow-up question, and this also relates to the keynote address and to the last presentation as well, is a lot of the emphasis I noticed in in all your comments seems to be about the. Um, the human-human interaction, that is to say the provider-patient contract, if you will. And I wonder to what extent um, or how you would respond to this um, claim that things like bias, for example, um, is not within the control of the developer, that these things, you know, uh, a algorithms have bias, algorithmic bias, is um, something even the developer, the designer doesn't know because especially generative AI has emergent properties that we didn't know it existed. And so to what extent do we then uh, ascribe responsibility to the provider um, in, in such scenarios? Yeah. So maybe I'll start with this one, which is to say the following, right? I often say medical AI makes errors, medical AI is hard to understand, medical AI is biased guess what, so is your physician, right? Like all those things are true. And to me, the real question is, are we mitigating? And I know I'm careful about the words mitigating, not as a panacea, just like directionally, are we mitigating those things by the use of m medical artificial intelligence in an instance, or are we not? And I do think though, and this is maybe where we might disagree slightly, I do think part of the developer's job in validating and selling the model is to convince us that there's data to support the fact that it's actually going to improve performance along these dimensions. And where I think it's tricky is it's relatively easy to do that with a static data set when you show it radiological scans, a clean data set, and it does well. Much more difficult to know whether actually implementing it into a particular hospital system with particular workflow and particular kinds of physicians will produce the same result. And in a paper I did with Professor Gurka and some other people, we talk about this idea of a systems view, that really you should be thinking about this, and I'm resisting the desire to anthropomorphize here, and it's not a person, okay, fair enough, but you should think about 
adding an AI to your care team, like hiring a new surgeon to join a surgical team. And all the questions you might have beyond like what their prior records say is also relevant here. And what we really need is hospital level performance data and hospital level studying of it, but the market is not well set up to incent that. And the regulators we do have like FDA and the like are not well set up to evaluate that. Any other final quick question? Rice. Hello, uh, Dr. Glenn. Glenn's it's fine. <laughs> Not a real doctor, so it's okay. It's uh, an honor to meet you. After years of meeting you online on the Harvard X online uh, course, the ethics of. Uh, I'm shorter in real life, so, but very nice to meet it you wasn't too. Really, I'm so stoked to be here. I have a lot of people to thank, Dr. Jennifer, my advisor, Dr. Lindsay. Uh, yes. And, Dr. and Prof. Mikkel, I'm so happy to see you in person now. Okay, so my question now is, do you think that there are an actual efforts, and I can imagine these efforts are interdisciplinary and huge, it has to be huge, to ensure the AI reliability in biomedical science and, and healthcare? I'll say, and I'm I'll be very curious what Professor Richards thinks, I think we're in an advantageous position in healthcare as compared to other spaces because of the heavy regulatory nature of healthcare systems and FDA. I like often say, you know, the iPhone I think is one of the most disruptive things that have ever happened in my lifetime. Like my life is radically different because iPhones exist and it doesn't. And who reviewed that and who made that decision? Absolutely nobody except for marketers and corporations, right? The equivalent technologies in the medical space, there are a bunch of different gatekeepers and they drive up expense and they make it costly and there's all sorts of difficulties and they're imperfect and there's lots of things that get through their dragnet, but at least there is some kind of superstructure there that I think makes healthcare in some ways a place where it's easier to have sensible conversations, even if imperfectly. Mm -hmm. Claire, can I just add two friendly amendments, to, uh, additions to that? One I think is the, the existing framework of, of professional ethics. Which, which undergirds a lot of the sort of regulation in, in, uh, in advancement of existing ethical frameworks is much less objectionable. And the other, and this goes to Kristen's talk, uh, psychological harms are taken seriously and, and healthcare harms are taken seriously, which is not the case in the consumer or the labor context. Professor just added two things. He said psychological harms are considered uh, seriously. I saw that we didn't have the mic, so I'm going to repeat it. Uh, and so, uh, which is not true in the marketing. And the second is that the idea of professional ethics and a thick conception of fiduciaries is there in healthcare and not in these other spaces. All right. Well, thank you to our wonderful panel.